Okay. Can, I, can everybody hear me? Yes, seems to work. Cool. So thanks, everybody, for sticking to the last session. I hope I can provide some interesting uh, information and maybe some entertainment. So I'm David Bartolini. I'm from Oracle Lab, Zurich. And I'm going to talk about notebooks as enablers for uh, graph-empowered uh, machine learning. And this is, you know, what I will present is work shared by several colleagues at, uh, from Oracle Lab, Zurich, just not, not for, just from myself. But let's start from, uh, like, a, a, what is what is a machine learning system like? So what is the like a, a high level view of like uh, if you're the boss of a company, you try to hire a bunch of data scientists. This is what they're trying to do. This is there is some magic linear algebra in a pile, and then you throw some data in the in the funnel, and then magically you get some answers. And it's even worse, right? You get data comes from a bunch of different places. It can be a relational database. It can be some JSON files. It can be some CSV files different types of sources of data. You need to make connectors for those, put them in the funnel, and then uh, somehow use the, the pile of, of linear algebra, which is really a whole bunch of different tools. You have Spark, you have Pandas, uh, DL4j, you can have some R, a uh, whole different bunch of tools, right? And then you're trying to make some sense out of this, and you have this, this pole that you use to, to kind of uh, um, steer the pile so that you get some answers. Uh, so, so what is what is the tool that, that is emerging as that pole? It's, it's the notebook, right? Uh, I don't have killing machines in my <laughs> in my presentations, but <laughs> but I have some notebooks, right? So the the idea is that the notebook is kind of the tool that you use to steer your pile of linear algebra and get some answers. And what's nice about the notebook is that um, through this concept of interpreters for different languages, you can actually have one interface where you can um, kind of control what happens to your data and what systems uh, it goes through and, and how you, you build your answers. Like, so like, for example, here, this is clearly it's, it's a cartoon, but it's like these things actually, you know, we have implementations that work like this. So you can have some SQL code that does a SQL query, extracts some data from a relational database, and then you pass that query, uh, that, that data into a, some Python code that which does some pre-processing, right? Uh, and basically generates some um, some entities and model, and you can model your data, for example, as a graph, which is what the, the main topic of my talk, right? using graphs for machine learning through notebooks. Um, and then once you have a graph, you can, you, can, you, can, you can load it into a graph processing system, for example, uh, PGX, which is what we develop. And then you can query the graph so that the um, right hand side at the top, this is a PGQL um, paragraph, and PGQL is a query language that we're developing. And it's kind of like SQL, but it's for graphs. So you can express graph patterns. You can say that there is uh, some V vertex connected to some W vertex through an E edge. And then you want to query it. And then you can, in a notebook, it's nice for graphs because you, can visualize, because you can visualize them. So you can do a query, then you get the visual representation of the graph. It's really easy to inspect. And then <coughs> you can uh, do some learning, some machine learning on the graph. And then, for example, find graphs that are similar to this one. Uh, that said, uh, so notebooks you know, are a very nice environment. This talk is not really about notebooks, though. Notebook is kind of the pretext to talk about machine learning uh, using graphs. And uh, again, so the, the, the nice thing about the notebook is that via the interpreters, it makes it really easy to integrate all the data sources, build a graph, and then do some learning on the graph and extract some valuable information. So the, the, the rest of the talk is, is giving a few examples of some use cases where we can use um, graphs and extract information from graphs to, to learn some <coughs> insight, um, insight from the data. And uh, so I have a couple of examples about like anomaly detection, uh, doing some prediction, doing some similarity search on graphs, using machine learning techniques and graphs. Um, yeah, and of course, I'm not trying to sell any products. I have to, to put this slide to make legal happy. I'm just giving some ideas. <laughs> so uh, let, let's go back to the data, right? So the models. Uh, machine learning models, but in general, any type of, of data processing is, is only as good as data. So, so where is the where is the the insight in your data? Especially for with big data, it's, it's it's challenging, right? You have just a lot of data in different formats. It's where is the where is the insight? Where is the valuable information? Uh, with the graph, uh, it's it's in, it's in the connection. So let's let's look at an, at an example. For an example, uh, if you want to do product recommendation, what you're looking for is like uh, you know you want to recommend the product to me. 
you're looking for similar people who bought similar product, and then you will recommend me those products. But what does it mean? What is that similar? How do you define the similarity? So the question is really how do you look at all your purchase data and you find uh, the, the, the products that you should recommend? How can you represent this? And one answer, which uh, has, be, has proved to be pretty good, is using graphs. So the graph is a data model. It's, uh, um, you, know, you can translate from relational model to graph model or from a NoSQL model to a graph model. The point of the graph is that it highlights the connections in the data. So in a graph, you have entities, which are the vertices, and you have relationships between the vertices, which are your edges. And then what you can do after you have a graph is do, for example, some queries that, is, that are qu quite hard to express in, in SQL. For example, if you want to find uh, a connection between two entities with any number of edges in between, uh, with SQL you would have to do like an indefinite number of joins. If you use a graph query language, you can just express that you want to look for this connection, and then you can get uh, your answer. So there's, there's basically two uh, different ways to exploit graphs for getting, you know, learning something from your data. One is more trying to use directly uh, the information from the graph by running some graph algorithm um, to, to, to extract some knowledge from the structure of the graph as well as from the properties of the entities, and then use that, that information directly to, to, to answer some questions. Um, the, other, and, uh, the other one is uh, trying to actually uh, still kind of uh, map the graph into something that the machine learning algorithm can exploit, and then you, you learn uh, in a more traditional machine learning way uh, something from the graph, and then you get your answers from the model. So what the, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to show a few examples of both of these ways in which we can exploit graphs um, to get value from, from your data. So the first example I have is uh, anomaly de detection in healthcare billing. This is an example of like the first category I said before. So we're going to use uh, some analysis on graphs to extract anomalies from a data set. This data set is a, is a public data set from the um, US Medicare uh, Center. Uh, it's basically uh, a billing data set from hospitals from 2012. Uh, it's quite large, although not huge. It's like nine million, about nine million, or nine million records with 29 variables, and it basically includes like um, doctors and some, um, some, some, some visits or some other services that the doctors made on the patients, and it's basically used to, used to keep track of the costs of, of healthcare. So what we're trying to look for in this graph is anomalies, as in, um, so the graph has, as I said, doctors that provide services, so treatments or like prescriptions and so on. And obviously, each doctor has a specialty. There's, uh, you know, there's going to be a dentist and uh, eye doctor, uh, you know, all, all kinds of doctors. And it's, we can expect that each doctor will will be offering uh, services of, of of their own specialty. So the anomalies we're going to look for is some doctors that perform some operations which are typical of other specialties. So those are ano anomalies in the data because it's, it's unexpected, and then you may want to, to kind of try to look into it and analyze why this is happening. Maybe it's somebody is trying to put in more, uh, more, more treatments that they actually need to, to get money from the tax system or something like that, right? So how do we find these, uh, these cases? So you can, you know, if you think about anomalies, anomalies are rare, just by definition. So we have uh, many of these um, um, entries in the data set, and we are looking for very few which are anomalous compared to the to the overall. So it, it's uh, you know, and and the, and the thing is like it really depends on 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 you know we're looking for some treatments that are done by doctors which are not supposed to do those treatments. So it really defines on depends on the definition of what is normal. So let's see how how we can try to do this with a graph. So. Um, we model, we, we, we model the, the problem as a bipartite graph with the doctors on one side and uh, uh, health services or prescriptions and so on on the other side. And then there's a connection between the two sides if uh, a certain doctor provided a center, certain services, service uh, at some time. Um, and, and we have additional information in the graph, like you know, obviously the, the who is the doctor and the type of, uh, of, of, uh, of service they, they offered and so on. Now, based on this graph, what we want to do is uh, try to find uh, 
some doctors that are close to each other that's going to define what is the expected kind of services they provide. Uh, so, so basically what, what, what is going to happen is that all the doctors that are, for example, from internal medicine will be providing a similar set of services and then another specialty will be provided another type of services. We are looking for somebody who is from, uh, from the other specialty but also provides quite a lot of these other services from the... From the uh, from, for example, here we have a plastic surgeon who is, who is doing internal medicine um, services. All right, so this is, this is the, the kind of anomaly we're looking for. How can we define this uh, for, from the data, right? From this graph. So the idea is to use the personalized page rank score. So personalized page rank is a, is a slight modification of the classic page rank algorithm. So page rank uh, tells you how important a certain vertex is in the graph. Uh, based on how many connections it has with all, the, all, all other nodes in the graph. It's, it's basically the, class, the, you know, the, the original uh, algorithm that Google started using for, for web search. Personalized page rank is a bit different, bit, bit different because it starts from a subset of the nodes. Which, so we're going to start from all the, for example, all the, uh, all the eye doctors. That's going to that's be our starting set. And then we're going to go uh, simulate random walks to all the, uh, through the graph to all the other vertices. And then each vertex will get a score, which is uh, proportional to the probability of ending up there with a random walk, starting from a starting set. Right? So basically, the idea is that the vertices in the graph will have a higher PPR score, personalized page rank score, if they're closer in the graph, which means like more connected to the original starting set. This idea, you know, using PPR is, is, is more robust than just using something like shortest path. That's, that's a straightforward you know, way to measure the distance between two vertices that you could, you could think of. But uh, if you think about it, shortest path doesn't really explain. Uh, you know, it, it treats the cases that you see in the slide in the same way. So A and B are the same as C and D in, in, if you use shortest path. There's just one vertex in between. But intuitively, they're quite different. right? And so in the first case, there's many more connections between C and D. In the second case, there's like many other things that go through the, through the middle node. So, the, the definition of closeness is, is better captured by PPR than by just um, shortest path. <coughs> now, uh, the idea then is to use PPR score to say which are the ano anomalies in the data set. So we, we, we select a specialty, for example, optometrist, and then we find a set of doctors, of other doctors, that have a high PPR score starting from the optometrist, and those are anomalous. The issue with this approach is that it has quite a lot of false positives. Why? Because if you think about it, uh, some, some, uh, um, some procedures are just common. And everybody, all, all the doctors are going to do some, some of the procedures. So y y through those, basically everybody goes through those. So if you just look at the PPR score, you're going to get uh, many false positives. So we need a way to filter those out and, and, and really only get the, the actual anomalies in the data set. The way, the way you can do that is to notice uh, a property of, uh, of, uh, the, the, of page rank, right? So if you think about PPR, as I said, it's, it's a special case of page rank, where you start from a subset of the nodes. Instead, page rank starts randomly for, um, from any of the vertices. So basically, if you, th if you think about page rank, uh, the, um, the specialties or the, the prescriptions or operations that are very common, so that are done by many, many doctors, are going to have a very high page rank score just because they're connected to many vertices in the graph. So the idea here is to use, instead of just using the PPR score to detect the anomalies, is to use the difference between the PPR score and the page rank score of a given vertex. Because the page rank score tells you, like in general, in the whole graph, how connected is this vertex to everything else. The PPR score tells you how connected it is to the starting set. So the difference will tell you uh, so if, if some vertex has a higher PPR score than PR score, it means that it's more connected to the starting set than it is generally connected to any vertex in the graph. So this is the, uh, the metric that we're going to use to, to highlight the anomalies. For example, this is the, like an excerpt of the, if, if we compute the PPR minus PR score for all the vertices in the graph, and we look at the, at the procedures, this is what we get. So the, the highest scoring ones, and uh, yeah, here we're using the optometrist to, as a starting set for the PPR, the highest scoring ones are very specific to, to optometrists or eye-related operations. 
uh, while the ones that have even negative score, so they have higher page rank than PPR, are like very generic uh, operations. So this is like kind of a, a short uh, way to show that the, 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 uh, the scoring metric we use uh, kind of makes sense. Now, uh, so going back to the, 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 the whole idea, what we're going to do here is like the same as before. So we compute for each uh, specialty the personalized page rank of all the vertices, but also the page rank. And then we mark procedures that have PPR minus PR greater than a certain threshold as a specialty uh, procedure for that uh, specific kind of doctors. So if, I, if we start from eye doctors, all the procedures that have higher PPR score than PR score are going to be marked as special, spe specialistic procedures for that type of doctors, because it means they're more connected to those type of doctors than generally to anything else in the graph. At this point, uh, we still have one problem, <laughs> that uh, the, the, the categories of doctors are not, uh, it's not a partition, they're kind of overlapping. For example, we have uh, optometries optometrists and uh, uh, ophthalmologists, we kind of do, which kind of do the same things because they, they are related, right? So what we want to do is like to not mark as anomalous uh, those doctors that are in a category where most of the doctors have uh, satisfied a PPR higher than PR score. Because those are like, we say, okay, that category is too similar. We are interested in a category of doctors that is not very similar to the ones we are looking at, but just some of them. Are, are, are end up being very close. So let's look uh, at, a, at, a, at a graph. Maybe <laughs> it becomes a bit clearer. Um, so the, in, this, in, this, uh, in this graph, we have uh, the colors indicate the different specialties of doctors. The uh, x-axis is, is, the, um, is the difference between PPR and, P and page rank, so it's the score we are using. And the y-axis is the count, so how many, how many, uh, how many vertices are exist for each of the values of PPR minus PR. If you look at the, all the yellow uh, specialties, those are, have very low uh, scores, even lower than zero, it means that those are not interesting for us because those are not anomalous. There's, so we're looking at, uh, at the optometry doctors here, and those are very far from optometry doctors because they have page rank higher than PPR. And then we have the ophthalmologists, which are the, uh, which are the, the, the second uh, histogram there. Which, which have pretty high PPR minus PR score, but like all the category has it. So again, we, that's probably not uh, an anomaly. It's like just a similar, cate similar category of doctors. What we're really interested in is the, is the short spikes uh, next, to the, next to the zero line. Uh, those are like, there's just a few doctors from those categories that have higher, higher uh, personalized page rank than page rank, right? So let's look at an example. So here, I think we're starting, it's the same example, so from, uh, uh, from the um, uh, eye doctors. And what we find by uh, sorting uh, the, the, the score is that we have actually uh, a few specialties that are anomalous, and like we have one uh, radi radi radiologist and one gastroenterologist that are doing uh, operations that are typical of eye doctors. Right, so let's look, for example, at the gastroenterology, and we have this doctor who is doing like removal of eye fluid and blah blah blah, all these sorts of so all these sorts of uh, of eye specific operations. So what you can do in, in, with this kind of analysis is you f you get some data and then you can inspect and see whether it actually makes sense or not. This is this is a very important uh, property, as as was mentioned before, like being able to explain uh, what the algorithm algorithm tells you is is, is quite important. So now I have a short demo that shows this implemented at R Studio, uh, connecting to the which connects to to, to BGX, which is the um, the graph processing system. Let's see if I can play this. Okay. Uh, let's see what happens. Obviously not. Uh, yes. Okay. So. I hope it's big enough. So what's happening here is, uh, first, it's uh, connected to the, the graph server, which is the graph analysis server. And then it's, uh, um, it's loading the graph into memory. So the graph that we modeled um, with the doctors and the specialties is being loaded into memory. And then we define the uh, specialty of interest, which is optometry. 
right? And we define the parameters, so the anomaly level is 5%. And then we run page rank and personalized page rank on the graph. So the, you know, the, those, those metrics are being computed. At this point, we're going to run a couple of queries of those PGQL queries that, uh, that I showed before to select and show uh, basically what I was showing before in the slide. So this is selecting the, uh, the vertices where the specialty is what we were looking for, and then it's selecting the, the, the kind of operations or, or, or uh, prescriptions that they, that they do. So here we get the list of what eye doctors do, and, uh, and we get the, the score of uh, personalized page rank minus PR. So these are so the top ones are basically the, the, the specialties that are typical of eye doctors, right? And then uh, we run another query, which selects instead the, the generic procedures, right? So this is again what I showed before. These are the ones that are provided by most doctors. So those are the ones that we're going to filter out from the, from the anomalous cases. For example, initial hospital care and so on. Right, and then we run this other query to uh, identify the anomalous cases, as I explained before. And we're going to get that uh, the most similar category to, to, the, to the eye doctors is the ophthalmology, uh, which is very, has very high similarity, and so on, right? And then finally, this is basically the last result that I showed in the slide. We get that uh, uh, we get you know, some gastroenterologist who was doing a lot of these specialty procedures, and then we can inspect uh, what those procedures are and, and, see, and see the results. And we do this both for the gastroenterologist, and this is exactly the same results I showed before, and then we also do this for the, for the other one we had, I think, was a cardiologist. So, so basically, uh, what this is trying to show is that you can exploit the connections in the graph to extract some information that may be really non-obvious uh, if, if you don't consider the connections in the graph. Right. Yeah, so this is going to do the same for the cardiologist. So this is first example, as I said, was to kind of motivate the fact that looking at the graph uh, is important and it can provide very, important, very relevant information. Now the question is, how can we uh, try to do this more in a more automated way? Because here we were basically going there and defining metrics and then basically using the, the results from the graph directly. There was basically no, no, no learning algorithm, right? But then the question is, uh, how do you connect graphs and machine learning? Graph is a, is a, is an, is a, the graph encodes sparse relationships, right? It's like connections between entities, and, and they're sparse. But machine learning normally works on, on dense features. So you have a, you know, one odd encoding vector, and it's a dense vector, right? So how do you, do you, do you connect those two things? So this is a pretty hot topic in, uh, in research. There's been, like, in the past, you know, four or five years, several uh, proposals. The core idea is from 2014, and this is one idea we built on. It's called DeepWalk, and the idea is that you can actually use tools that are already existing for natural, natural language processing to translate the connections in a graph into something a machine learning algorithm can understand. Uh, so the idea is that you take your graph, and then you do random walks on the graph, um, to uh, basically extract some strings, and the string is the sequence of, the, of visits uh, that you do in your random walk. So, for example, we start from, from vertex 1, you go to 2, and then to 4, and then to 8, and, and that's one random walk, and then you do another one, and so on. And you generate all these random walks, and then you consider those as if they were sentences, and the single visits of your vertices were words. Then you take this representation and you throw it into a natural language processing model called, uh, for example, uh, Word2Vec or similar techniques that basically turn, by, by using a, a special kind of neural network, they turn these sequences of, of words, in our case vertices, into vectors. And then you get a vector for each vertex. And the nice property is that the distance in the, in the multidimensional space between two vertices, between the two vectors, 
that are related to the two given vertices will be small if the two vertices are closing the graph. So this property is very important because you can map the graph onto a multiple dimensional space where the distance, is per the distance preserves the, 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 the vi vicinity in the graph. Let's look at an example application. Let's say, let's say we have a data set where we have students and we have courses in a university, and for some students we know the department, for others we don't. We want to be able to predict the department for the, the students that we don't know the department of but by, by, by leveraging the graph. And if you think about it, this is the same as a, a customer segmentation problem, where the student is a customer, and taking a course is like purchasing some item, and the department is the, is the segment, right? So we're, we're trying to predict the, the segment of, of, of those customers we don't know the segment of, right? So what you can do uh, is you use the technique that I just, just explained, and we're gonna, uh, I'm going to show results for four different cases. The first case is just a traditional convolutional neural network trained on just the features from the vertices. So like the, the age of the students, the, the course it took, and so on. And then we try to use just PPR, the same as before, uh, and use the PPR score as the prediction metrics to, to, to say which, which is the department. So the, 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 the vertex, which is a student, which is the highest score, score in PPR, the department of that student, which is known, will be predicted as the department of the target student. Then we try to mix the two things and then train a, a convolutional neural network by using the embeddings that are generated using DeepWalk. And finally, we add the categorical features to the, to the same CNN. The, the first result, which is probably quite surprising, is that just using PPR is better than using the convolutional neural network on the features. Um, this is, I mean, it's both surprising, but maybe also obvious, because what you're doing here is like you're using better information to do your prediction. You're using the connections from the students to the courses, and you're using the structure of the graph to do, to do the prediction. And the nice thing about PPR is that it's completely unsupervised. You, you don't need to train anything, right? So this is the kind of an example of, of the same technique we were, uh, I, I discussed before. But then, uh, when we try to use the, to learn the embeddings, and then train the network on the embeddings. This is the green, uh, the green line. And yeah, by the way, so the, the x-axis is the iterations of the training of the, of the, uh, of the convolutional ne neural network, and the y-axis is the accuracy. So accuracy tends to improve, obviously, by, 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 by training more. Um, and then, the, so the green line kind of approaches the limit of PPR uh, with, with more iterations, because basically you're using the same information. It's just translating into, into into the um, into the vectors, but then if you also use the other features, you can even you can get better better results than than both of these because basically you're just using more information. In some cases, the structure of the graph was not enough to predict, but if you also use the categorical features, you can actually do better. Let's look at one. one let's go one step beyond. Now, in the in, in that case, in the in the student's case, I was trying to predict a property of a certain vertex in the graph. Another problem that people have looked at is trying to um, classify somehow an entire graphs. So um, let's say I have, I have a large graph made up of smaller graphs, and then I want to find some way to compare them and say, oh, this, for example, I have this graph, which is for, some for whatever reason interesting, and then I want to look for similar graphs in, my, in, my, in the space of my graphs. How can I do that? There is again a technique uh, from 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 research, uh, and then we have we have our own extension that that enables you to do this. Basically, the idea is very similar to the. Oh, actually, first I have an example. Uh, to make it a bit more concrete, think about uh, financial transactions, and want and you want to to identify money lender money laundering in uh, in in your graph. So basically, circles of money that is being, trying to be hidden, right? So, so what normally happens is that there is, there's a department that looks at these transactions and tries to identify uh, patterns that correspond to money laundering. And then there's some system that identifies this pattern, and, and you end up with a lot of false positives as many, and, and many specialists that need to go there and try to understand whether this is, a, this is actually money laundering or not. So the question is, can we, uh, can we train a machine learning model to even learn new patterns from no ones? So if, if I have a library of patterns that are labeled as, as, uh, as money laundering cases, can I, can I train a machine learning model on all the patterns in my graph defined by subgraphs 
uh, and find similar ones that can be you know, uh, sent for, you know, there can be an alert and that they should be, they should be further investigated. So this is the case we're talking about now. The idea is quite similar. So the, 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 the idea behind this is that now you don't have just one graph, you have several graphs. And then for each of them, you do the random walk dance that we did before. And you get again all those sentences for the walks. Uh, but now it's like you split it up into paragraphs. Each paragraph corresponds to one of those subgraphs. And then again, you turn to network language processing and you look for a technique that, that you can use for this. And it turns out there's one. It's called paragraphs to vec. So word to vec was mapping words to vectors. This is mapping paragraphs to vectors. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit different, but it, it gives a similar, similar result. But now what you get is a vector for each of the graphs. So for the, 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 the first graph, we have a vector, second graph, we have a vector, and so on. And again, the distance. Uh, the, the specifically, the cosine distance is normally used between these vectors in the vector space will be small if those two graphs are kind of similar. So this is uh, the, the technique that you can use to, to identify similar graphs in, a, in your space. Uh, what, we, what we've been working on is this thing called PG2VEC. So graph2VEC is like uh, intuitively mapping graphs to vectors, but it only looks at the like the label of each of each vertex. So it just looks at like, oh, I go from vertex one to two to three and so on. It doesn't look at the properties. But uh, in the real graphs, properties, so that the, the attributes of each vertex or even of the edges can have a lot of information inside, right? So what we do here is not only consider the, 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 vertices, the, the idea of the vertices in the random walk, but also consider the properties. So then if you have two different subgraphs where the uh, the random walks are similar, but they also have similar properties. Those two will be more similar than two other graphs where the topology is similar, but the properties are different. So basically what we're doing is adding more information for the algorithm to, to improve the, the, the accuracy. Additionally, what we do is uh, instead of considering just the vertices in the walk as the words in the, you know, when mapping to the, to the natural language processing algorithm, we consider edges. Uh, so basically the pairs of vertices that you visit. This uh, also improves accuracy because it, it provides more information to the neural network, which knows that I not only went from here to here, but it's like I went, I connected these two specific vertices uh, in, in the th through an edge. Additionally, we also put global properties of your graph. For example, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the financial transaction use case, you may know that in this specific pattern, you had two entities that are similar. And then if you insert that, uh, that information into the, into the random walks as well, or for example, the size of the subgraph, you can get even better accuracy. So with this, uh, um, with this algorithm, we run an evaluation on, uh, on, uh, on a data set about uh, cancer. So it's, it's about um, uh, some uh, um, uh, protein, I don't remember if it's, no, it's not proteins, it's, uh, well, chemical compounds that may or may not be related to cancer. So some of them are labeled, uh, so you know that uh, this compound is related to some kind of cancer, some of them are not. And then you want to find for some unknown compound whether it can be related to cancer or not. And this is an example of a vi visualization of these graphlets, uh, or of these compounds, it's two of them. And uh, yeah, so it's basically represented by vertices that have a certain label attached to it, and they're connected in some kind of molecule. Now, the evaluation we run is that uh, with PG2VEC, we can actually get very high accuracy on predicting the label of whether a compound is related to cancer or not, and much better than Graph2VEC because we are using the additional information. I have another short demo about this. Let's see if I can also run that that basically shows a notebook environment that we're developing where you can, uh, yeah, so basically this is getting the similar uh, graphlets to uh, starting from one of them. And then you can run, um, get the, basically the properties uh, or the count of the labels in all those graph graphs that have been found similar from the algorithm and you can see that they're quite close, right? So this is again a way to inspect the results of the, of the uh, of the algorithm. So the, these are the four closest ones. And then we can do visualization, of course. And then we can just run and get 
uh, that this is the, 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 the query one, so the one we were looking similar graphs uh, for, and this is, these are the ones that are found. And you can see that there is this circular pattern with the three, with the, with the vertices labeled the three, that they're curves, and then the, the other one. So you can actually look at the data and see that what the algorithm told you uh, is similar, is actually visually similar, right? So this is, this is all I had. Uh, you, you know, this is actually uh, implemented. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to have a beta version that includes the, these uh, machine learning libraries for graph. Uh, it's not available yet, um, uh, but, uh, but we're going to publish it. <laughs> and uh, so PGX, uh, which is the, the, the system that, I was, uh, that, that I've been using for the graph analysis, is part of uh, BDSG and OSG, which are the spatial and graph options for big data for the Oracle database. Uh, you can uh, and uh, and with the uh, with this feature that that is going to be beta for now, you can load the graph model, compute, uh, and then and then you know create a graph model and then export it and then use it for whatever machine learning task from with with your favorite uh, ML framework. So we are not doing an ML framework; we are just doing the part that uh, extracts the data from the graph into a form that the neural network or some other machine learning algorithm can understand which is the kind of the missing link to exploit this information. And uh, yeah, so the, I think the QR code should point to the tech network page for PGX. So this is just for the graph engine. Uh, the version that's out there now does not have this feature yet. We are still working to publish it, but pretty soon we should publish 3.2, and you can just download it and, and for, for trial purposes, just run it and then see if it works for you, the use case. That's all I had, thanks. I think we have a bit of time for questions before getting a beer. <laughs> Any questions? We have a question here. Hello. Hi. Uh, you have shown in the demonstration how you, you were loading uh, data. Mm -hmm. uh, how long it takes to, to load the 9 million records and I don't know ah, how That's much. a very hard question. Do, I don't do, do you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, because I understand that the, the demonstration was maybe compressed. Or yeah, it was a bit compressed. Uh, I don't remember, <laughs> so that's a real answer. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the comment is like, it, it obviously depends on, uh, on where you're loading data from. Uh, so the performance, I mean, for example, if your data is in a database, um, what we can do is, uh, for example, load, like run multiple connections to load in parallel, so you can speed it up. But I mean, eventually it depends on the bandwidth you have to your, your data source, and it depends on like how, uh, uh, you know, part of the, of the task is loading the, the information about the vertices, and, and edges, part of the task of loading is also creating some indices on top that allow the graph engine to, to answer the queries fast. So we create an index, so part of it is, is creating the index. But that should be hopefully fast, because it's, it's parallelized. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the general answer is I don't know, but it should be fast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. So thanks again. And uh, I'll be around if anybody has questions. <laughs>